Welcome to Focus on Albany. I'm Cynthia Pooler and my guest today is Arthur Swartz. And Arthur is a election law lawyer and he's going to talk about he's going to talk about all of the shenanigans that are going on uh, because of redistricting. So Arthur, will you are you amused or not so amused by everything that's going on? Uh, I, I guess I'm mostly amused. Uh, the I, I I was quoted in the New York Post recently. Uh, I'm also I'm chair of the Manhattan. I'm the, in the law chair for the Manhattan Democratic Party, so I'm supposed to bemoan uh, what happened and that it's not fair. Blah blah blah. But I said the Democrats got what they deserved. Um, the you know the, the 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 Democratic Party just overreached. You know, we we complain about gerrymandering everywhere else in the country, and then in New York they went and did the same exact thing, and it may not have been uh, racially oriented, but but it it was so clearly they they manipulated the districts so clearly uh, that that it was. It was it was obvious to me from the beginning that they were in trouble once 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 the lawsuit was filed. So this was supposed to be done by an independent entity, but it was pretty partisan. What do you think? Right. So uh, you know the um, the way that this um, the, the the way that the way that this unfolded was that a. Um, I'm going to go to the end with the decision, but it explains what went on. The the Republicans went to court in Steuben County, and anybody maybe up up in Albany, you know where Steuben County is. I'm not sure exactly where Steuben mm -hmm. County. Actually, I know a friend of mine uh, initiated the lawsuit, and um, they went to Steuben County. Uh, but the judge that they found was was pretty smart. Uh, he had a long argument, took very detailed expert testimony from both sides, retained his own expert to analyze the maps. Um, and the biggest problem he had with his decision was that he heard arguments on February 20th, and he took until um, April 20th to issue his decision. So by April 20th, everybody had already, I think that was the day before the end of petitioning um, to get on the ballot. So he, kept, he says several times in his decision that, it, that I had 60 days, I had 60 days, I had 60 days. It was a long time, but it was a very well thought out and decision. And then it went up to the appellate division that sits in Buffalo. Uh, and then it went from there to the New York State Court of Appeals. And the New York State Court of Appeals ruled, um, it took until, um, it, they, well, that went really fast. By April 28th, there was a, there was a decision. Um, so the, ba the basic the basic thing that the, the Court of Appeals describes, which the judge below described, is in 2014, when we adopted a constitutional amendment in New York which means that it, it passed the legislature two sessions, and then it was approved by the voters. And that amendment set up a thing called the Independent Redistricting Commission, IRC, which was supposed to um, make proposals to the legislature. It, it was a commission made up of, um, of Republicans and Democrats. It was allowed to come up with two, two proposals, um, it was supposed to submit it to the legislature. If the legislature didn't adopt one of them, then the commission had the authority under the state constitution to adopt a proposal. And the reason that we amended the constitution was to avoid partisan gerrymandering, uh, which the, the, the constitution of the state of New York said was unlawful. So what happened was, in, I find this hysterical actually, uh, the, 
in in 20 this is 2022 in 2021 the, the Citizens of the state of New York voted on a new constitutional amendment to eliminate the independent redistricting commission um, or to allow the legislature to override their proposal. And it failed. The voters voted no. And then the legislature passed a law, which was somewhat astounding, which gave them the authority to over, overrule the independent redistricting commission. And then they proceeded to do that. And they proceeded to do it without the kind of hearings and analysis and study that, that one is supposed to do uh, in the course of adopting maps. Uh, There's supposed to be a study of uh, both of interest groups and of Republicans and Democrats and independents. And uh, it's not supposed to be drawn in a way that, that uh, influences, that, that, that is designed to uh, dictate a particular outcome. But that's what the Democrats did. They just did it. And, and, it, and you know, it's, it's pretty hard for anyone to say that, that what happened was surprising uh, because it happened. And in fact, they violated the law. Um, it, it's interesting that in the Court of Appeals, the, it, it, the, the decision was four to three. Um, some of the judges tried to wiggle around it um, and say that it wasn't really partisan. But I mean, I can give some examples and show how incredibly, I wouldn't even call it opaquely partisan. It was like a, a clear pane of glass. Okay, go ahead. Give some examples. So the, the one, I'm, I'm not, one in New York City, <coughs> excuse me, where I come from, um, the, we have one Republican Congress member. Her, her name is McCall Maliotakis. Mm -hmm. She is from Staten Island. And her district is mostly Staten Island and some parts of Brooklyn that are uh, largely white working class. Okay. Staten Island is a mixed community, but, but it's still a majority white working class. So Michelle got elected. Uh, it's made, it's had Republican congressperson except one term. I think uh, uh, before she got elected, there was a Democrat in office uh, for two years, and um, so they redrew that district so that they connected Staten Island or most of Staten Island to Park Slope, which I call sometimes with, to my friends the People's Republic of Park Slope. Um, it's one of the more liberal uh, districts in this, you know, communities in the city. They sort of drew a line that connected Park Slope, which has no, no political, cultural, institutional connection with Staten Island. They drew a line into Brooklyn, got Park Slope in there, and all of a sudden it became a majority Democratic district. And not only Democratic, but liberal de Democratic. Um, it's where Bill de Blasio lived. Um, and so, so that was one of the lines. It was, so it was guaranteed that Maliotakis, you know, was going to have a hard time. Um, and that, that was one district. Then there was another district in the state Senate. Um, there's a state senator named uh, Alessandra Biaggi, who, who I, I love, right? She's wonderful. Her, her, um, her, she, she was a, somebody that beat the chairman of the, um, IDC. The IDC. Uh, she ran this, she went, she was about 28, 30 years old. She ran, she, um, she beat, um, uh, the chairman of the IDC and, um, and, Became a, you know one of the more liberal voices in this. Uh, um, I'm someone that supports progressive Democrats mm -hmm. in in the, in, le in the legislature, um, and it was the, there became an open seat in the third congressional district, which historically has been the the western 
part of northwestern part of Nassau County to the North Shore on the Long Island Sound and Queens, connect, which connects to it. Just been a Queens, Nassau County district. They do but this Senator Bayashi lives in Westchester, right? right? Right. So, and that district beca became an open seat because Tom Swazi decided to run for governor. Um, so they drew a line that took it up over the Throgs Neck Bridge. It ran along the shoreline in the Bronx. It was two blocks wide in the Bronx because that was they were taking part of uh, AOC's district away. It ran two around two blocks in the Bronx. Maybe two thousand people lived in that area, and then it 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 um, got up to Westchester, uh, and and then it ran along the coast of Westchester, just ironically through the town where Alexander Biaggi lived. What the the and these were Westchester towns also along the Long Island Sound. Um, uh, near Shell, Rye, up through Rye, up to the Connecticut border. So it was a district that had no, that, that part of New York had no connection to Nassau County, but it was designed for Alessandra to run. Um, and I can tell you it, it pissed off a lot of um, uh, progressives because uh, we had a candidate in Nassau County who had run against Swazi last time um, Melanie Dorigo, and here was why was what the legislature was making. So it was that kind of di redistricting, and I know they did stuff like that upstate also uh, to try to make it harder for Republicans to win uh, in both the Senate and the and the and the Assembly. So the judge, the judge ruled that it was on April twentieth. He ruled that it was unconstitutional, and and threw out the lines and ordered that new lines be drawn. Uh, and that there be, and he would reserve the decision about whether it could be done in time for the June 28th election, June 28th primary or not. Mm -hmm. um, it went up, as I said, it went up through the Court of Appeals by the 28th of, of April, it was very fast. The Court of Appeals upheld it, and then it went back to that judge to figure out what to do. What he did was he decided that they would be, they would not be, that, that the Senate election and the con congressional elections, which is what he his case addressed, uh, would not be held on June 28th, the primaries, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, that they would be held on August 23rd. So on August 23rd, uh, we will have, so on, on June, June 28th, people are going to vote for governor, lieutenant governor, um, there's no other statewide positions up, they will vote for assembly, they will vote for, uh, if they're Democrats, they're going to vote for county committee members and they'll vote for other local offices. There are a lot of local races going on, state legislative races, uh, county executive races are going on, on that day. And then people are going to have to come back on August 23rd, which is a horrible time to have a primary, <clears throat> and vote for congressional candidates and New York State Senate candidates. Now, we're... We're recording this on May 29th. There has not been a final decision on whether there's going to be one or two primaries, right? No, no, no. There is a final decision. There are two primaries, um, one for assembly and statewide and one for Senate and Congress. Okay. The, the I'll call it the fun part that the judge added in. The people said, oh, my God, I petitioned. Some of the people who ran for Congress, they petitioned in March during horrible. It was, March was a horrible month to petition. I'd have to say in all my years, it rained. It was freezing all over New York State. It snowed all over New York State. The people had to get their, you know, their uh, 1,250 signatures for Congress or 1,000 for the Senate. And, and they were holding their heads saying, I have to do this again. Uh, so the judge said, if you got on the ballot in any district, you could be on the ballot in a new district because the lines changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, you could be on the ballot in the new district and you could pick what district you want to be on, anyone. So Biagi is now running in a district that is in Westchester and Rockland County, uh, where she doesn't live there either. 
but at least it's a little more connected to where she lived in Westchester County. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, Mondeer Jones, who was the congressperson from that district, but was being challenged by someone that moved over another district, Sean Patrick Maloney, he's running in a new district that is lower Manhattan that runs down the middle of Brooklyn, including Park Slope. Uh, so, 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 um, so Mondier is running in where I live, which is in Greenwich Village. He's running in this new district, which has no incumbent. Um, and, but, and he doesn't have to petition. But a lot of other people are, at the judge also said, but anybody else who wants to run can petition to get on the ballot. So in New York City, in our in my district, the 10th, Bill de Blasio was running. Bill de Blasio was running for Congress in this new district. Uh, and there are a lot of new people that have jumped into the into various races. Uh, and uh, in my district, there are, there's an assemblywoman who jumped in, there's a second assemblywoman who jumped in, there's a city council member who jumped in. They're all gonna run there and um and it's it's kind of it, it's created it, it's actually made to some extent the primary is a lot more interesting and one of the more interesting consequences is um one of the most interesting lines that the judge drew or the judge's expert drew is manhattan used to be the, the lower part of manhattan up to up to about 110th street was divided uh, north south, like Fifth Avenue was sort of a line. And one of the, they had actually gerrymandered that line because there was a very strong um, opponent to Carolyn Maloney, who's been in office since 1992. Mm -hmm. um, so they moved her district almost, almost so that, uh, almost three blocks off the Hudson River. She was, uh, was an East Side Brooklyn Queens candidate, mm -hmm. uh, her district. So they took all of Brooklyn and Queens out. And they made it a Manhattan district all the way all the way to the west. Um, so, but it still was a north-south line. This expert came in, decided he was going to draw a line across the middle of Manhattan like a belt. Mm -hmm. So now, Carolyn Maloney, who was in the what was called the 12th congressional district, is in the same district as Jerry Nadler, who okay. used to be in the 10th congressional district. And Jer but Jerry lives. On and around 79th Street, and if he wanted to stay in the 10th, he'd have to. He'd be running for an office that starts at 14th Street, and he decided, unlike Mondaire Jones, uh, that he wasn't going to do that. So he's running against his friend Carolyn Maloney, who, because Jerry's also been there since 1992. Oh. Uh, so these two veterans are running against each other, and it's they were always the best of friends supporting each other. And now they are the worst of enemies. So these two, these two Democrats, it's not, that's not gonna cost the Democrats a seat because, because a Democrat will get elected in the new 10th district where I live. Uh, but it's a fascinating race between two 30 year incumbents running against each other. And that was one of the, one, one of the lines that I said, the Democrats got what they deserved. Uh, they played with they played games with it, and now they're going to have this fascinating race between Jerry and Carolyn. And there are there is a candidate running, you know, more to the left. Who who the hell knows? It could win the race and beat both of them. Are you surprised by the craziness of, of this election cycle? Uh you know, it's unfortunate. It, it's really unfortunate. The the it could it could mean that the Democrats lose a seat. In, you know, the Democrats have um, New York lost one seat in Congress okay. Okay, because of the because of the the uh, census. Um, right. Our wonderful government. I think we were about eight hundred population short, and he didn't appeal it. If they, if they had found 800 more people in New York State somewhere, we would have had the 27 congressional seats. Uh -huh. So we lost one. Out of the current 27, the Democrats have 23. The okay. Republicans have four. Uh, so the, the way they designed the lines was 
they thought they could get they could design lines that would pick up four seats. They would all they they designed 24 majority Democratic seats. So those would have been four more seats that the Democrats could pick up, sort of an answer to the gerrymandering that exists in Florida and in Georgia and in other states that have redrawn lines to make it more favorable to Republicans. It's a sad thing because if we do elect a Republican Congress, now I'm partisan, I'm a Democrat. If we elected a Republican Congress, we are going to have, we already have stalemate in Washington, but we will have double stalemate in Washington because we will have a House of Representatives that is going to reject every proposal that the President of the United States makes um, and a lot of legislation that we've already had trouble getting legislation through because of the Senate, it's going to stall in the House. And this is a point in history where we need a lot of government action, whether it's about health care, whether it's about poverty, whether it's about guns, uh, uh, whether it's about voting. We need the, the, the government of the United States to function. And what having a majority of Republicans with a Democratic governor, and it, it it's beginning to look like the Senate will stay um, Democratic. Uh, but without all the three bodies being of the same party, we always have stalemate. And that's not good. Once upon a time, that didn't necessarily mean stalemate, but now in today's politics, it means stalemate. So do you think that what's happening in New York can, can change the ba balance of power in the House of Representatives? Right. So I think it's it the... The fellow that drew the lines drew it, he says he created 15 competitive districts out of the 26. Uh, he couldn't make them all competitive because there are parts of New York State where there are no Republicans. Believe it or not, you're upstate. We have, there are parts of New York City where there are, there are no Republicans. Where, where I live, um, where, where I live, uh, I think that the... Um, uh, the Working Families Party has as many um, voters as the Republican Party does. You see, you see results in elections where, you know, uh, the Democrat gets ninety-five percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very hard to turn it this the the lower half over anywhere in Manhattan into a competitive area. Mm -hmm. um, but so, but it could mean that the, the Democrats don't pick up the four seats, they could lose more than four seats. Um, you know, it, it's it's a very interesting year. People are very upset about inflation. Um, inflation, inflation, inflation. You know, I remember that, uh, I think it was under Clinton's, one of his aides uh, came up with this phrase, it's the economy, stupid. Right. Right. You can be providing people with and, and even though we, it's astounding to me, we have, you know, unemployment is back down below, as low as it's been since 1960. Um, wages are surging. Uh, I'm a union lawyer. I know that I just walked into contract negotiations and I said to the, the company, I said, you know, the average wage increase in 2021 was 4.75%. That's what we want for the next three years. And the employer looked at me like I had three heads. But I said, that's what everybody's getting. Um, so wages are up. Unemployment is down. Um, you know, now the other thing is COVID is, you know, COVID continues to um, abound. Uh, I'm sitting here talking to you with a case myself, no matter how hard I tried. I, I've avoided it for two years. Um, but so people are unhappy because you know what? They go to the store, milk costs, milk, gasoline, to care about it. I, I don't know what it's like up in Albany. In New York City, gasoline is, is up around six dollars a gallon. Uh, and we're, home we're, home. we're pushing five. You're pushing five. So yeah. that's hard. It was it was probably around three and a quarter. So now it's five. Mm -hmm. And home heating oil um uh is up. Gas prices, the natural gas prices are astoundingly higher. Mm -hmm. Um which means electricity prices are going to be higher. So all these basic things, we have food shortages. We have, uh, we go to the store, we can't get anything. And everyone blames the president. 
I don't know that it's his fault, but you know, as I think Truman said, right, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think we could be in for a bad, you know, even in New York, we could, the Republicans could pick up seats uh, in Congress. Wow. Wow. So that it's, it's going to be interesting. And what I find very interesting is the uh, fact that incumbents are squared off against each other. Yeah. Yep, that, that's it's very interesting that incumbents are squared off. And and even like some situations where um, uh, you know, a race between Mondaire Jones, who was a first year Democrat in Rockland, running against Bill de Blasio. I mean, that's a marquee. That's a fight like of all time. Or with Alessandra Biaggi running against Sean Patrick Maloney. You let know, me ask you, let me ask you. Let me ask you a little bit about that race. Was Senator Biagi unhappy in the state Senate that she wanted to move on to Congress? What's your What's your knowledge? I, I mean, some some of this I don't want to say on the radio. Okay. Uh, I I don't think she was unhappy in the Senate. She was doing a great job. Okay. She's a very ambitious uh, person. Like most politicians, you know, you, most politicians, it's, I've been in politics for a long time. Uh, I've only wanted to run for an office beyond, I'm the Democratic district leader in Greenwich Village for 25 years. Uh, I once ran for a higher office. I found that you need an enormous ego to do that. And so most people who run have enormous egos. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if they win, their egos get more enormous. And they think they should rise higher up in the, wow. in, the in the process. I, I think it's a, you know, it. I don't think it's just in the U.S. I think it's everywhere in the world. And okay. um, so I think Alessandra believes she's, you know, in her four. She's been in there for all the four years. Four years. It's not like she's been there for twelve years and thinks it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. She's been there. Jerry Nadler was in the state assembly. He got elected in 72. He, I was in college and he was my assembly member. Uh, and then he went to Congress in 92. So he did 20 years in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. And then he moved up to Congress. You know, that's that's cutting your teeth, you know, showing, learning your, your job. Mm -hmm. Alessandra thinks, and I like her, she's a lovely person, mm -hmm. uh, but she thinks that she's, you know, ready for prime time. Wow. And a lot of people think after they saw AOC, who was, who was, not ready for prime time, who, but who learned really fast. I love her, um, but she. I had her on my. I do a radio show on WBAI in New York. I had her on several times before she won, and I was not that impressed with how prepared she was. Wow! And she won, and she has been wonderful. So, people think that they can do it, and AOC shows that anybody can do it. So, they were. So we're out of time. So you've been listening to Arthur Swartz, who is a election law lawyer. So Arthur, give your contact information if anybody wants to contact you. If anybody wants to contact me, they can send me an email at a Schwartz, S C H W A R T Z at afjlaw.com. Or if they can go to AFJ. A like Apple, F like fun, J like jump, law.com, uh, www.afjlaw.com. And there's an info button. And if you send, you can send emails and it winds up in my email. And that's that's the website of my law firm. And I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Focus on Albany. If you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Arthur, thank you so much. And you have a great Memorial Day weekend. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you.